we had the pleasure of meeting a few years ago and I'll tell you what, like Eric is a talented, talented individual. And uh, I'm not just stroking his ego. He really is a talented individual. To me, Eric defines what a true artist is because like he, you know, all of the things that you do, like whether it's music, it's film, um, bodybuilding for a bit, motivational speaking, um, you've just been like a really positive light and like a really encouraging, um, I don't know, just like a really good encouraging soul. But I remember um, what was so cool was we worked on a commercial together mm. uh, and I, I, I feel like on that commercial that we really connected even more on a deeper level. And I remember being like, man, not only is Eric such a talented man, he's got a real depth to him. And, and from that depth, I, I know you, you've created like all kinds of cool things and, and artistries and whatnot. But then, um, and we're going to go into this too, I was watching, watching The Chosen, season two, episode four, mm. and I got to see you in that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Eric's also in The Chosen. This is fantastic. We, <laughs> we, we share that as well. Not the same episode, but... Um, anyway, so it was really fun to like see you in there and to see you do your, uh, we were just discussing what kind of accent it was. It was like a, a, a some sort of European accent. I'm not entirely sure what that was, but like, a, say, say it again. What, what, what would you the call technical it? The technical term was, the, was an attempt to hit transatlantic and it, it made a little change, but we, yeah, yeah, dude, it was amazing. <laughs> but, but dude, I, I really appreciate you being on the podcast. Like this has been so fun. And, um, the Lemonade Stand Stories podcast is all about people's Lemonade Stand stories. So like their beginnings into whatever entrepreneurship or creators or acting or producing or whatever it is. So sure. I'd love to hear your story because I know, you know, your family uh, were all entertainers. Mm. So did you grow up thinking I'm going to be an entertainer as well? Or was this something that you're like, I, I really want to do this because this is speaking to my soul? Great question. Um, so I was raised in the family and uh, as you said, like as a normal person, Yes. But just naturally, the quote unquote spotlight was like almost always on. So I wasn't, you know, all of us, there's about 54 of us in the second generation. Mm -hmm. And um, we're all assumed to be in the same spotlight as the first generation. And that's not always mm -hmm. accurate, especially when there's only a handful of us in yeah. the second generation that um, carry on with the entertainment industry to a, to a point. Yeah. Uh, nothing like the first generation exactly. The one closest would probably be in Alan's family. So you got Nathan and David. Yep. And, and, um, you know, some of us like Tyler, Tyler's also an Alan's family. So it, and I can name off a whole bunch of my cousins that still do it, but uh, we're always assumed to be entertainers. So we're kind of forced in a way yeah. to be in the spotlight. So by choice and by not by choice. Yes. By choice yeah. and by not by choice. Yeah. But dude, like, I, I don't know, like it's, it's so interesting cause you know, I'm, I am friends with David and, and everything, but it, I remember like when I, when I met you, it was like, it was great because you didn't in my mind you didn't typify like what i remember like like donnie being or whatever but like you had your own brand you have your own voice um when did you decide i want to be an artist oh i think we're all artists only some of us admit it no oh, i like that yeah. that's so great i don't know it just came out maybe that's what i said before dude no like, no it, it was great so when did you admit to yourself you want to be an artist that you're an artist um as a kid i mean you you immediately know when somebody says, "Oh, that's really good." Well, that's really good. You know, if any if anybody has that kind of tone as a child, yeah. you're playing with blocks and you're like, "Oh man, this kid can make a sandcastles or something." You all of a sudden you're just that kind of person. You're meant to be right. a creator, and like I said, I believe everybody's a creator. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if it's sandcastles or simply being able to have an art of a discussion or a conversation, the art of telling a joke. You know, anybody yeah. can be an artist because everything I believe is a form of art. Dude, that's so great. And, and it's true. I, I really believe that we were all meant to be creators of some sort, right? Mm -hmm. And um, when people own up to it and say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to walk the path that others have, have trod. I want to create yeah. my own thing and, and make my own uh, path come to life. Um, it's a beautiful thing to watch. Now, you have done a variety of things. And, you know, and we were just talking a little bit about this before, but like music and film have been like kind of where you've landed as like this is this is kind of where I'm yeah i'm at right so um would you say that your music career first was the thing that took off or were you like i want to go into acting first or how did that all come about um so there's a lot of twists and turns in my story yeah i'm and, excited uh, <laughs> where to begin where not to begin sure. where, where to kind of curve around the certain walls sure. is an interesting path but um i think it's easy to say 
that I did not want to be in the spotlight. And I'm not okay. saying that I do. Okay. I do not consider myself famous by any means. Because today, the word fame is a whole different ordeal. People can pay yeah. for fame. You can pay for a following. Yeah. You, I mean, you can you can do whatever you can to um, hack the system to create this, you know, pseudo fame in today's world. So fame really doesn't mean anything to me, especially growing up with it. Yeah. Because I was always in that spotlight. I couldn't go to the grocery store with my dad. Uh, uh, especially with any of my family, if they're, you know, without being, hey, can I get a photo? Can, you know, back in the yeah. day, we did a lot of autographs, or my dad did a lot of autographs, and they would ask me as a kid, can you sign this too? I mean, you're his son, right? Yeah. Can you sign this as well? And yeah. and people have pictures of me as a child that they would post. And I, I never thought it was weird at all. I thought it was just normal life. The rest of my yeah. family, some, some, some people um, who've grown up with that kind of circumstance, my, my family seems to be very cool with it. But yeah. I've seen people who have, like, in their center, second generations of their you know, first generation parent, be very uncomfortable with that kind yeah. of spotlight. But for me, um, I just always thought it was fun. Mm. So I was not weirded out by somebody asking me for an autograph as a child yeah. or a photo, you know, with my dad, because that was every every time I went out in public with him. Yeah. Well, Almost it, every time. <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, we were talking about like, I don't know, child actors or, or people that kind of grew up with fame and it really gets to their head. I, I've oh. I've seen I've seen like things like um, mm -hmm. I have a good friend of mine Alexa Vega she's like in um, like the Spy Kids movies and stuff like that mm -hmm. and we did a movie together and I remember talking to her and I was asking her hey you've been in tons of movies like since you were like a little kid how did you stay grounded and and she came from very Christian uh, parents and you know she's a Christian herself and and her parents would not let her get away with anything like like just like because oh I'm famous now or anything like that but what about yourself like how were you able to like stay grounded when um, the whole world in a sense was, was kind of like looking at you guys oh great question being grounded is something that can either be taught or is just kind of ingrained in who you are as a person I think mm -hmm. as a kid uh, one of my cousins told me she's like you're not like the rest of us are you and I was like what do you mean like that she's like it doesn't get to your head like mm -hmm. you just you're just like a normal dude and I was like oh I always made it funny, like, oh, no, you're just silly, you know, yeah. that's fine. But to me, it's just like, it's a regular thing to be considered someone, oh, that person's in the room, let me give them attention. Well, I'm always wanting to give that person who's not talking in the room attention. Like, the camera guy's here, him over there, him over there, his name's Branson. Yeah. You know, that's my, that's my hometown growing up. Like, I'm going to address that he's in the room, and that yeah. he's in the room, and we're here. I don't just see you. Yeah. I see everybody in the room. And the one person who doesn't talk, I'm going to go talk to that person. Yeah. So that makes me somewhat, according to my cousin, from that conversation a long time ago, we were on a cruise ship when that happened. And like, like I said, that's a cruise ship where my dad was entertaining on that cruise ship. There's a lot of hype going on. Everybody wants to talk. And I'm over there talking to the person who's quiet. You learn about their life story, why they're mm -hmm. in pain. How can I bring up that level of energy in the room? Because there's like a dip in the room and I feel it. And I want to go over there and, and elevate the it. and go talk to that person Yeah, because they're not feeling as uplifted as everybody else. So I want to kind of feel what's going on and equalize that energy. Dude, that's a really interesting and a beautiful uh, way of living life because it's true. Like it, you see a lot of um, inequality in the earth, you know, among people and, and everything. Right. Yeah. And um, it's very interesting because see, I came from India. I was born there and I saw a ton of it. I, I saw a ton of it. And, and I always remember thinking like, well, what is it about me that like my family happened to have a little bit of money so that we could come to America. Whereas right outside of my house were tons and tons of people living in cardboard boxes, right? So it's a very interesting dichotomy to see like the inequality of, of the human race sometimes. And, and it's cool that you're able to like recognize that and say, hey, you know what? In this room, that person isn't loved enough or that person is, is too quiet. And maybe they choose to be quiet and that's totally yeah. fine. I've been wrong many times. About yeah, that but, but, but other times it's like, they would love to feel loved too, you know, and yeah. they would love to feel like this sense of like, oh my gosh, someone came and, and cared for me. Mm -hmm. And I, that's just a beautiful way to like live life and approach life. And I think like it's, it's, it's very empowering. So I, I love that about you, man. That's, that's awesome. It's, it's interesting though, because like, you know, we were talking about like different uh, music and, and artistry and, and all these type of things. Cause you said like, it, it's become kind of normal to you. What is it about the art that has drawn you in then? So I will say this. There was a time where I was, you know, growing up and have my childhood and traveling the yeah. world. I've, I can't tell you how many countries I've been to as a kid. And that sounds really, that's not, that's a prideful thing somebody could say. Yeah. But for me, I'm just saying literally there, are, I've been to so many airports, you know, I haven't actually totally. experienced outside the airport in a yeah. lot of places, but I've been all around the world. Yeah. Then you have this chapter of being in rock bands in my teenage years, my early twenties. 
and then you have this this kind of dip where I went into this um, seven year period of just doing real estate. I learned about wow. sales and I left everything because I learned at that point. I mean, I never wanted to do it as a profession. I always had, I made two albums before I was 21 and I mm. distributed them out. I've since, you know, pulled them back. And if anybody has those albums, let me, let me know. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll get them from you. They're, they're, they're yeah. collector's items now. Some, somebody messaged me, they have one that was pretty cool. So anyway, um, I had this period of time where I did not do music, art, anything. I literally stepped on my personality, stepped on my soul to make money. I made over $100,000 by the time I was in my mid-20s, cash. Mm. I had it. And I was like, okay, great. Now I can literally disappear. Is that what I, you wanted to do? I wanted to disappear. Like I wanted to just like, I've got the money and I was ready to go. I've since had some dark stuff happen since then Yeah. Um, where I no longer am in that position. But I was in this place where money was my focus. And so mm. I had a life change. Something happened to me where I was back on stage and all of a sudden back into the same spotlight. I couldn't leave it. There was a time when I finally said, okay, I'm going to quit real estate. I'm going to do that. And I counted it as like in the Bible, you know, the number seven has a thing, right? There's seven days in a week. There's always sure. seven this. I had seven times where God came into my life. If I may say God, if please, I may say that. The, please, the, the, we, we, we're anything, very open. I we're was, very open to talk about God on okay, this podcast. Cool. So, so yeah. I mean, we were on the chosen. So We're on the chosen. I, yeah. yeah um, but seven times God came into my life and said, no, you need to do music. Really? You need to be back into this spotlight. Mm. And I'm like... There is no money in the spotlight, having made good money in my 20s. Yeah. And, you know, I'm 30 now. I'm not going to say I'm like super old, but hopefully it doesn't yeah. show on camera. I'm not gonna... You look but, wonderful. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> there you. So yeah. There you. I'm 40 though. So there oh, we go. There yeah. you go. You yeah. look great. You look great. Wow. Thanks, man. Yeah. Um, and uh, either way, what I'm saying is, is that um, something happened where I had to make a life change. And I'm sure we've all had those things in our life, yeah. right? Where we thought we were going one way. And I will tell you this, one of my favorite things um, that I quoted from something I heard like in church, actually, but maybe yeah. I didn't even hear it in church. And it was one of those things that you hear in church. Yeah. And uh, it was a buddy of mine. Um, hopefully, I don't know if I can say his name on this, but uh, he's, he's doing some big stuff right now. Yeah. And he and I were backstage and he was like, Erica, because we've been done a few gigs together. And he said, oh, Erica, I'm afraid that um, I'm doing the wrong thing with my life. Oh, wow. Okay. And, I, and I said, let me tell you something I heard in church recently. And I hope I'm not misquoting this, but you, um, if you think you're doing something in life to pull off God's plan for you, let me tell you something. You're not that powerful. Hmm. In other words, you can't do something without God keeping hitting you, hitting you, hitting you, because you're not dead yet. Yeah. You know, we're all going to die someday. Surprise. But the yeah. idea is that. You, you, you are here for a reason. You're here to accomplish certain things. And God is going to do the best way possible by influencing something, somebody else. Even yeah. me with him backstage stage with this guy to just say that to him because he said it shocked him. And then he kept going on the path that he was going for. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see him every time he makes a post and stuff, what he's doing with his life now because he was at that kind of point, it seemed. Yeah, that crossroads, you know? Yeah, and I mean, I don't want to speak for him, but if he's watching, but uh, there are those moments where you feel like you might screw up your life pla uh, plan and that's mm. not the case. I don't think that's in your Dude, that's such a, that's powerful, man. Because, you know, even me, like I decided very early, like what well, I'd say early, early twenties that I was like, I want to go into acting. Like that's what I want to do. That's my path. Mm -hmm. Um, and I very quickly realized I can't be a musician because I don't know how to do music, but I was like, no acting is, that's my thing. That's my jam. And I love it. And it's so fun. Yeah. But it was very interesting because, um, there are times I've definitely wanted to give up. There are times I've been like, dude, I'm not making any money at all doing this thing. Like, why am I still doing this thing? And then it was like, well, um, I'm not finding, like, I, I'm not able to, like, I don't know, didn't have the, I've, I had all these narratives in my head. Like, oh, I didn't make enough money. I don't know if I'll be able to support a family if I get married and yada, 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 all this, these different type of things. But at the end of the day, I remember, like, constantly being led back to this this path that I'm on mm -hmm. and realizing, Hey, you know what, that plan, whatever that plan is that God has for me, it is so powerful that like, he's going to make a way for things to fulfill and fulfill themselves and be awesome. And I just have to keep with it and keep doing things. And it's interesting because the last few years, things have gone well for me financially and, and things have been picked up and I'm like, wow, like I, I, I felt like in the, I was in the bleakest of bleakest of times in LA and then things kind of worked out, you know, and it's so interesting to say for you, for me to hear from you that like, yeah, I did real estate and I thought I was just going to disappear. And now all of a sudden God's like, nope, you're doing music, buddy. Mm -hmm. You got to go back to it, you know? 
Yeah. So that's an interesting story, man. I, I love that. Well, I'm I, I glad you hear that. I'm glad you're still with us in this artistic world. Look at what Dude. you're doing, man. This is great. Dude. Well, you know what? Here's the funny thing. This happened because of COVID. Can oh, you believe that? I, I started to do Zoom podcasts just for fun because the entire industry kind of stopped. Mm. And I just did it for fun. And all of a sudden, um, one of the people I interviewed happens to be the owner of this digital marketing agency, Lemonade Stand. And they're like, Sharon, why don't you come and do the podcast for us? I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm having so much success, like uh, uploading my Zoom podcast on my Facebook and getting 12 views, 13 views. He's like, yeah, that sounds promising. Come and do this for me. <laughs> I'm like, all right, sounds good. And so I came here and now and I'm doing this, right? So it was an interesting thing where I just did this because I wanted to. It felt authentic to me. And then it turned out to be an awesome, fun thing. You're good um, oh, well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, so I kind of want to talk a little bit about your... Um, some of your, like, I guess, acting roles, because I was so stoked to see you on The Chosen, and The Chosen's been, like, such a big, big thing that everyone, like, knows about. Can you talk to a little bit about, like, your story of how you got involved in that production and how that all came up to be? Oh, The Chosen. Who yeah. has not seen The Chosen? Okay, awesome. Yeah. We've all seen it. It's an amazing show. Yes. Um, wow. I, it, it was such an honor. I'm going to start off with that. What an honor. Yes. To be involved, even at the extent that I was. And um, from what you told me, I'm excited to see your scene coming up. Thank you, man. Thank you. Um, even though we have our, our, our parts in it, it's just awesome to be part of something much bigger than ourselves. Like in yeah. our gigs, like in acting and stuff, we can be like the lead in a feature film or something. And that's a different energy than it was to just play a part in kind of the savior's life, you could say, in a yeah. way through this production and kind of around it. And um, so the way that I got on The Chosen was just like everybody else, you audition. Mm -hmm. And... With my part, I auditioned, and uh, my manager Michelle was like, "They they want you to Dallas wants you to to audition for this part," hmm. and I was like, and "I asked my assistant Pepper, and who's here today at the studio, and uh, she's like, well, we can do that too.' And, and there's a different character entirely, and yeah. I'm like, "Do I do I look the part? Can I sound that part? So that's a different character." And then they asked me to 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 do, to do it a different one. So I auditioned three different times. Mm -hmm. Um, for different characters and the first two were I, I guess I could say it now the first two were just soldiers and so we were studying we were watching the episodes and we were looking at it like hey they had one some of them have accents and some of them don't right like I'm like okay that's very American accent yeah. and that's very English that's kind of more transatlantic as far as the yeah very close together English and that and we'll talk about that in a second but um, I got the role of Petronius Hmm. Uh, which is this uh, first of its kind character in the series. I didn't see any other character like this and I was expecting to be a Roman soldier. Yeah. So I walk in there um, expecting to talk just like another Roman um, guard and um, I had a conversation with the uh, um, dialect coach and she said transatlantic. If you can do it, do it. Because not many, not everybody is doing it when she's like, I've been asking them to do it and they're not doing it. Yeah. And so I said, oh, I can do it transatlantic, you know, transatlantic, some, some, some of it's English. It's yeah. very similar. She's yeah. like, no, no, don't be too English. Transatlantic is a, a proper way of, of speaking on stage. And weren't you a stage actor? And I was like, no, <laughs> I did not do stage acting. Yeah. I did improv comedy in character form and I did pranks on people, but I did Great. a lot of different yeah. stuff. So more like rock music and yeah. I can do an accent and do these things. So anyway, long story short. I get this role of being this, um, what was it, Peps? Well-fed Roman. That was the name. That was the setup. Petronius is a well-fed, yeah. well-dressed Roman. So I show up expecting to be, what does well-dressed, well-fed mean? And I dress up in this pompous outfit. And then I come out of the thing and I'm talking to everyone on set. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's, you, know, you put that down. You put that back. Yeah. And it's just this English. So I took on this English role of this pompous, uh, if yeah. that's the right word for it, sure. kind of you know, um, transatlantic slash English kind of person uh, in accent. And so everybody on set thought I was from Europe. Dude, I did not. So and great. As soon as, method, as soon as the method thing hit. Yeah. Because I'm very method. Everybody wants to say I'm so method, you know, yeah. I never broke character. Yeah. I never broke character. Dude, that's amazing. Except for when Jonathan himself came out and met me. Yeah. I had to, I was in the midst of breaking character while I had my conversation with him because he thought I was from Europe and, yeah. and from English, from, from England. And anyway, that's a different story. I had, I had a walk with Jesus. I literally had a you walk, had a with, walk Jonathan, with Jesus. Yeah. Back down to set to say goodbye to Dallas because I wanted to just do my part and leave. I didn't want to cause a stir. Sure. He's like, did you say goodbye to Dallas and everybody? And I said, no, I didn't. I didn't want to disturb anybody. He's like, everybody wants to meet. We want to make sure that we know who you really are. And so we were going to say goodbye, goodbye yeah. to Dallas. Anyway, so he walked me back down to set. But this is a long answer to your no. question. I, I apologize. No, please. This is amazing. 
and I met people from VidAngel there. Yeah. The, they were the, the, I think it was the owners of VidAngel. Yeah, Her, like Jeff and Neil, or who I, was I, it? Somebody high up in, I think it was a wife of, uh, I didn't catch, catch their names okay. because I was so busy just talking to everyone. I didn't catch sure. their names, but they were awesome. They were so funny. They wanted pictures with me and they were giggly and they're like, where are you from? And I would just like, you know, play it off and then keep going because yeah. nobody knew who I really was. And that was the funniest part about it. And so I love that. Never dude. broke character on set that entire day. Um, and, uh, and, and I remember Dallas coming up to me. He said, do you know why you got the, got the role? And I said, w why? He's like, because you didn't overdo it. <laughs> so Are you I was serious? Like, I was like, am I overdoing it? He's yeah. like, no, no, no. I like it. But I, I mean, it's yeah. a different flair. I didn't even know you would look like this. I was like, I don't know either. I thought I'd be a guard. Yeah. So I broke accent, uh, broke character just to talk to him real quick. So he's like, I like this. Okay, keep doing what you're doing. We're going to make we're gonna make this work. So yeah. I played it up and bid this, oh, you know, I don't like this place. I kind of picked out like the characteristics of Matthew because Matthew's kind of more yeah. detailed. And so I wanted to be like, oh, this place is gross, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's kind of what happened. Yeah. It was it was just, it just happened. I don't know. I loved what they did with it, the editing. And Dude, hopefully it's... I gave them what they wanted. I was worried about it. So. No, I, I know, I know. It's such a nerve wracking thing, right? Being on that production. Um, I Because you get on set and you're like, oh my gosh. It's like, I don't want to let anybody down, <laughs> you know? I want yeah. to go and do what I did. And the thing was with me, I got the part the night before we started shooting it. I think I heard something. Yeah, like, said something that I'm yeah used Dallas to, yeah. was mentioning that. And it was kind of a crazy thing, but yeah. And, and the same thing, like a lot of times when I do an accent, they're like, hey, can you do an accent? They're like asking for an Indian accent. Oh. So I'm like, oh, that's mighty racist of you but sure i absolutely <laughs> right. can absolutely Jeez. i can but but this was more of a like a like a hebrew type of accent and so mm. it was like an interesting thing and for me i was thankful that like just being around the the actors who have used this accent quite a bit i'm like okay yeah i can i can kind of like nail it a little bit so yeah, you pick up on so, it, yeah, yeah i picked up on it and he yeah. was able to do it and i probably shouldn't talk too much about it just because my episode hasn't come out but it is uh coming up in a couple episodes I'm so so excited it'll be so to fun. see you and you're your be very 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 exciting yeah, yeah. so it's awesome um now the one of the big things with the lemonade stand stories podcast and this is a podcast that's meant to empower youth meant to okay. empower young people you yeah. know um, cause so many people have like dreams and, and whatnot. And if we know anything like last year was a brutal year for a lot of people mm -hmm. and they felt the weight of it. They felt, um, isolated, they felt depressed. Um, and so one of the biggest things we love to do is to talk about things that have gone on in our own lives that have been heavy and how we got through it. You know, like our own like lemonade stand stories, our own mm. time when the lemons hit us pretty hard mm. and we're like, I've got to figure out a way to get out of this. And how do I change my mindset? How do I change my philosophy? So I'd love to like talk if you're open to it about any instance in your life where you're like, that was a hard blow. That was oh, a yeah. tough blow, but Oof. yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get through this and I'm going to be stronger because of it. And how did you get through it? Um, I gotta be careful what I say here with these sure. ones, but uh, it would be a lie to think that this life is is uh, easy. Yeah, it can be considered simple in some ways. You know, mm -hmm. wake up, go to sleep every single day until you're done, but mm -hmm. it's not easy. Um, I believe everybody is here to experience both the good and the bad. You know, because otherwise, how can we chisel our characters and become who we're supposed to be? I believe we have a destiny. We have. Mm -hmm. a, a vision to essentially uh, obtain whatever, wherever that comes from, whether from you or inspiration or from somebody else. I mean, the idea is that we're all trying to strive. We, hopefully we're all trying to strive to be someone or some like something. Mm. Um, and in the course of achieving anything, there's always going to be hardship, you know, opposition and yep. all things as they, as it's said. And so um, my, I'm not going to get emotional. I'm going to hold that in if I can. Sure. I do. It's all good. Yeah. We'll, we'll cry on camera. We, we do that. We're, we're paid to do that. We're paid, we're paid to do this. Yeah. <laughs> and the best part about it is if we're good at crying on camera. I remember once, once I cried for, it was a five or six hours, perhaps five hours in between there. Literally. I'm not exaggerating. Wow. On set um, uh, for a production because it said that in the script. And so in between the takes, there's so many people on there and I was crying for five hours and I was just drinking water and kept going. Everybody thought I was just freaking out, but it was great. I just kept it cool, but I was... Wow. You've done that, right? No drops? No No, no stuff? dude. I, I have to do the drops, You can man. get... Oh, okay. I, I, I got to use drops. I can get there. I, I have a hard time because I don't cry that much in real life, you know? Oh, I cry all the time. You do? <laughs> That's amazing, dude. I need to be able to cry more, you know? It's all good, man. Yeah. Um, there are people who can help with that. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, I believe uh, trauma is the best source of artistry. 
mm. in my opinion. Why else would we create these monuments if, uh, you know, something no. had no impact? And usually impacts are, I believe, I, I think, you know, there's the horse that's motivated by pain or the dog who's chasing something just because it's there. Uh, most of us are motivated by pain. And so a typical artist in general, generalities, if I may say, were motivated by pain. And the best um, songs, the most relatable songs are those, you know, you just want attention. You know, a lot of songs are motivated by pain. Um, yeah. And so loss, and I have had, I've had loss to the point of, okay, I've had loss to the point of um, bubbling up over my chest. I had a heartbreak once from somebody who, uh, uh, I won't speak negatively, but yeah. somebody who hurt me really bad. And it kept happening over and over, a heartbreak situation. So much so that I was put in an emergency clinic for um, a bit there, having surgery to cut me open because I was bubbling up over my chest. So physically, physically, there was a physical the reaction. Doctor came, so the next day, yeah. he said, Mr. Osman, I can't explain it. And I'm hit sit there with a patch on my chest and um, and just gushing out this weird pus and blood. And he's like, I, I have this scar to prove it. He's like, I, if nothing happens to you, and from what you told me, this is a physical manifestation of a heartbreak. Wow. And so I've been through crazy stuff. I've had jaw surgeries. My entire face has been ripped off. I've got scars here. I've got scars here. So I have reminders every time I look in the mirror. Um, of what I've been through in life that I can pull from for lyrics, that I can pull from for trying to cry on set. Mm -hmm. I can use all of that for energy. And, and, and it's like, um, the question is, well, you want to be too negative energy, but you've harnessed that and you can use that for anything yeah. now. So I can, do an, I can do a really dramatic scene. There was another scene where I was in the mountains. Um, it, it was a death scene. I was being shot. And yeah. I had people, every single person on that set was like, are you okay, dude? Because I had to step away and cry it out yeah. and then come back. You know, you have, yeah. that's what we do as actors. We, we have, have to. to go there. Yeah. You just pull from those things. It's no problem. But we get over it, right? You know yeah. I mean? It's, it's, uh, it's a thing. But that's what it is, right? It, yeah. Like, it's interesting when you have like these incredibly traumatic things that happen and, um, and you're like, how do we, how do you break out of this? And how do you like make it, you know, come out the other side and, and become positive and, mm. and whatnot, right? I mean, I, I think about my life and, you know, like, like anybody, right? I've, I've had my own fair share of grief. I've had a lot of people close to me pass away and that's been its own level of, you know, grief and pain. Oh, completely. Um, uh, I've had parents divorce multiple times. And so when you kind of go through some of these things and you have these like weird emotional, um, kind of bonds, it's very interesting. Um, I haven't even been that public with it, but like my grandpa, uh, he's probably he's probably gonna pass away in like a couple of days or something, right? He's my mom's dad, and we're very close to him. And it's very interesting because grief and trauma. It's 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 interesting what happens to me when we get faced with these type of things because everyone I feel like reacts differently to this type of stuff. Mm. I react in a very eerily calm way. Yeah. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like some sort of like, like some sort of like uh, mechanism or something. But I, I sometimes feel like this need to like say, okay, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just focus and like figure out like what are the logistical things that need to happen right now? And how do I, how do I solve the issues that are in front of me, in front of my face, yeah. right? But, you know, we were talking about like weeping and crying for whatever reason, when I do cry or I do allow myself to weep, it takes a long time for me. It, it's like, it's so bottled down. It's almost like there's like a subconscious thing saying, no, you can't weep. You're a guy. Right? Cause I've been told that a lot too. From oh, my that's, family. that's such a lie. It's a lie. And we've been told that. It's, so we've been it, yeah, taught, told we that, to right? Discover that for ourselves, yeah. And so we had to discover this for ourselves. And so I would unhealthily not grieve. Mm. And it's healing, man. The brain literally heals when you cry. It, it's so healing, right? Yeah. So it's almost like I have to like go to my own private place away from the entire world. Mm. And only then do I feel safe when nobody else is around to grieve. Yeah, and even then you hear a bird, and you're like, oh, and I'm like, wait a minute, oh, shoot. Yeah, what's going on? She's got I got dust in my eye. Don't don't look yeah. at me, you know? Yeah. Cause it's like this weird thing. Mm. But um yeah, like I think there, you know, we were talking about art and everyone is an artist. I think there's actually an art to grieving oh, and, yeah. you know, and when you're actually able to like authentically grieve, mm -hmm. especially, um, you know, the pain that you went through, would you say that that was like the thing that helped heal you from some of the, some of the trauma that you had in the past? 
um, the grieving part of it. Part of the grieving was it, as as a healing factor. Um, I think we have to grieve. There's like a, a grieving. Uh, there's a cycle of uh, what's it called? There's a grieving cycle, a loss mm. cycle, cycle yeah. of loss, where like part of that is grieving, and then the other part is you know like coming to terms with it. You know, the first one is shock, and and it's not really happening. Or yeah. Whatever the case, like there, there's a cycle for it. So grieving is part of that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's an interesting thing because. Um, you know, you and I were talking about like some of the music that you've been writing and mm. some of the albums that are about to come out. Mm. And you were saying that a lot of this is from my own, like my own trauma and my own pain, but I'm so excited to share this with the world because yes. I really feel mm -hmm. that it's going to impact other people and it's going to help yes. resonate with other people. How is that going to do that? So I released one of the songs way early on, about four years ago now, four years ago now. Okay. And it had a really great response on social media really fast. And when that happens, usually that's a really amazing video or really something people are connected hey, to. Hey, is this person okay? They're connected oh. to it or, or, or it's shocking. Um, right. You know, somehow it kind of went, you know, minimally viral in my own world. And I used that video to relate to so many people. Like I remember in the sauna, I showed the video to somebody. I just had a feeling I had to show, hey, do you need to hear this song? And I showed the song and... And they looked at it and they, they just started crying next to me in the sauna. Oh my gosh. I didn't need to say anything. Like, like this is me screaming and kind of crying. And I'm crying in this song. Like, I'm, I'm going full out in this, in this track. Um, and I took it down. You took it down? Took it down. Hmm. Because uh, it was about someone uh, ghosting me. You ever been ghosted? Oh, dude. Oh, it's like the story man, of my it's life. A thing, you it's know? the like, story hey, of my life. <laughs> I'm like, dude, it's like, oh, it's so dark. I, it's like, I, it's like Whoa. that Sixth Sense movie. I see dead people. I feel like I see them all the time because they just ghost me left and right. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah it's a story of my life. But yes, yes. Yeah, no, and this song will come back out and it is about that. Yes, it's that feeling, that heaviness that's like, uh, I thought we had a future. Yeah. And I have no closure still. Yeah. And so I'm like, you know what? This is a perfect way to share that art. And I have the original vocals. I've already, we've already got it mastered and everything. And um, waiting for one more track to be finalized before we can release that album. Yeah. Um, and then we have the remix of that song by a producer, Danny DeMosi, a good friend of mine. He did most of the music that's distributed now. Because I, like I said, I pulled out my two albums before. That's like 28 tracks. Um, and now I just have my songs currently. And one of them is with the uh, band that has that song in it. So th th there's a, th there are these two albums that are going to come out soon that uh, will have those really wrecked vibes of just loss and being ghosted and destruction yeah. of what it is. And it's all true story, so I gotta be careful wow. when it comes out. Well, you know what's so interesting? Um, man, th that topic of ghosting is such an interesting topic because I, just recently, mm -hmm. I would say like several, like and mostly it deals with like relationships, you know, or, like, or dating or whatever. And there have been several uh, girls that like, like we connect and it's like, oh my gosh, like, this is great. This is awesome. And the next thing you know, yeah, like right. it's just nothing. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, what yeah. happened here? You know, like, and, and yeah. at first, at first I was like, kind of like, oh, I know this is going to sound weird. Like, I mean, at first I was like heartbroken and bummed and like, I'm like, am I not worth it? Like what's going on? You know, yeah. all this stuff. And then like the, the narratives that go in your head of like, oh man, yeah. I'm like, I must like I need to overcompensate. I need to do more or whatever right. it is. You know, like what yes. do I need to do to be oh, better? You I know? totally did that. Yeah. Yes. And then I I go into like this phase of like like anger. I'm like well, they don't deserve me. You know, like yes, all this type of lost stuff. Cycle, yeah. yeah. But then finally, I kind of got to this point, and I was talking to a friend about it, and then he was telling me he's like, listen, um, you're a great guy, and if you're getting ghosted, that shows a sign of their own emotional m immaturity. Mm and their inability to function. And if you're getting ghosted in the early stages, could you imagine like right. being in an actual relationship right. like an, or like marriage, for instance, and all of a sudden they decided, I'm gonna check out, this isn't for me. Because the, the truth is, is like um, relationships, friendships, and every, all, everything is based on choice, mm -hmm. right? And people have to make the choice. And if you make the choice, but the other person doesn't make the choice, it's just never going to work. It, and you can't do any sort of forcing or any sort of manipulation to make it that way. Because if you do, then you will always know that that relationship was never authentic. And you would never want to be in that anyway. Anyway, those are all the things that I started like learning about and thinking about for myself. Mm -hmm. And I kind of came to like this certain peaceful place with it. 
where right now it's so weird because even recently I got ghosted by, by someone mm. and I said, but you know what? It's okay. It, it's okay. It just goes to show like, that's where that person is in their life. But I can be at peace because I'm at peace with myself anyway, right. with that person going to come in or not. But I, I will also admit it becomes very harder if you have actually go, formed like a pretty solid relationship and everything. And then it happens. Or what you thought was a solid relationship. Or what you thought was a solid relationship yeah. and it happened, you know? And that happened to me. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a very, it's a very challenging situation when it happens, but, and it's weird because I remember an instance that it happened to me and, uh, and then uh, like they, they, uh, she went on to get married to somebody else. But what was interesting was now I look back and I'm like, you know what? I am so grateful that everything kind of transpired the, the way that it did mm -hmm. kind of like thinking about like God's plan and thinking about like how, how much like the Lord knows us and everything makes me very grateful because I realized, wow, like even in the last several years, I've developed into a certain type of person yeah. that maybe I wouldn't have resonated with the person that I was like seeking right. after before, you know? You have to change but, to him. But how have you been able to like deal with those type of things other than writing epic music? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't do that alone. That was a lot of help with that. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, no man's an island, of course, I'm gonna throw that in there. But, um, with that, just to recap what you were just saying about the ghosting thing, we live in, we're living in a world right now where commitment is not really a thing. Yeah. We don't need to be committed because if, you know, you dump me or you ghost me kind of thing, they would say, I can find somebody with a swipe and you're gone. Like, like you know, like I can heal, like you said, overcompensating. I remember when I went through this trauma, this time, that, I mean, physical, the crazy stuff happening and there was even yeah. further trauma that happened where I lost all my money. Um, that's a different story. Um, that all happened about this about the same time and yeah. to compensate for that darkness um, I had to be in the spotlight I had to say hey I'm valuable yeah you know what forget all of the judgments forget all of your judgments I'm going to become who you guys already assume that I'm going to be I can go anywhere without anybody thinking oh it's an Osmond you're gonna go sing for me on my birthday yeah. I made a little video on that it was my first video you know happy birthday in the elevator um, you're talking about compensating and dealing with this uh, mindset of today and with art, that can help with that. Yeah. Absolutely. So we all have those songs that, well, first of all, we know where we were. If you, if you pick a song from some time in your past, you know where you were geographically yeah. and what you were going through at that time. Mm -hmm. So when you hear that song again, psychologically, you were reminded immediately, a sense yeah. memory, or per, per se, of what was happening. So that song is now a stamp in your life. And you can always go back to that song. We all have songs like that mm -hmm. of, you know, I know exactly where I was, what I was doing when I listened to that song before. So if I want to relive that, I can do that. And I made yeah. that song that we we're talking about that's coming back out. I used that song to first to get to practicing, to crying and connecting with a character on film. Yeah. So that how that's how art has helped me to match those emotions where needed. I'd say in Gosh, acting. it's it's so interesting, you know, like that that whole topic you're you're saying of like overcompensating for darkness. That's an interesting that's an interesting thing. And I love what oh, yeah. you're saying about like how commitment is not a thing anymore you know it, it's it, not it's not and it's very it's yeah. very interesting like <laughs> look i you know my my grandparents um you know i've been doing a lot of thinking about them and we were like looking at old photos just yesterday as like reliving uh, experiences from my grandparents life and everything they got married my grandma was 16 when she got married mm. and my grandpa was like i don't know eight years older so was that 24 um he's now 88 and and she's 80 and um it's so interesting because look at like the majority of the, her life has been with him, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and they have learned like what true commitment is and they just like stick, st stick, stick together. Like that's just what life is. You just, you're with each other and you're helping each other out. And, um, it's funny cause like some people ask like, Sharon, do you have commitment issues? And I'm like, well, I have issues feeling like I'm going to be safe in a relationship. So maybe mm. I'm scared to commit unless I know I'm safe, <laughs> you know, see. you know, but do I have, um, commitment issues? I don't think I do. I think I would be able to be committed if I feel like, like this is the person and like, I want to commit to, right. does that, if that makes sense. But it's very interesting because our society is in a place where, um, for whatever reasons we're mm. like hey oh you're done well, i'll just go ahead and swipe somebody else and, right. and like am i am mostly going to cut you off immediately mm. why do you think we're in that place right now 
Um, I, I, I feel honestly that a lot of it to blame would be uh, technology and how fast it is. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I was just talking with someone today earlier about how, um, you know, the attention span, of course, is gone. ADHD is a thing. I have ADHD, you know, yeah. all over the place. And I'm using that for, you know, my industry. We, we, that, if we can be yeah. ADHD and be creative and then we're hired to be that, that that's great. You know, if we're yeah. entertaining, we're doing a pot, you know, we're, yeah. we're, we're talking. But the reason that I feel that we're all over the place is because, again, there's no need for commitment. We can easily get anything we want really fast. We yeah. don't have to have patience. Patience was a thing back then. You know, like I had to, to yeah. we had a way to wait for stuff. What's waiting? If I'm if I wait for a second, yeah. if it's loading. If loading issues on your phone, oh, I'm done. You put your phone away. You're doing yeah. something else immediately. Like there's no muscle yeah. with patience because patience is a muscle. Yeah, I think. Um, it, if anybody relates to that, that's just, dude. Well, there was this joke I heard this comedian was saying, and I was dying laughing. He said, he's like he he said I he lived in a world where he had to wait 10 years to watch every episode of Friends, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, dude, that's amazing. Because, yeah. like, nowadays, it's like, oh, dude, you just stream it. It's like, wait, what? Yeah. So, um, yeah, there was a moment where, he, okay, great, you enjoyed it, now you got to wait. Now you got to, like, right. just do these things. Yeah. Now it's, like, instant gratification, instant and, gratification, and, yeah. you know? And if you're not instantly gratified by the this thing, I'm going to look for the next shiny object. I'm going to look for the next shiny object. I'm going to say it. I'm yeah. going to say it. Gen Z. Dude. I said it. Bro. You went, you okay. went for it, We're going to fist bump on that. Just kidding. No, Dude, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Make yeah, it awkward. All right. So, is. yeah. Yeah. And, and I it's... believe the majority of Gen Z generation, if I may speak as a whole, my friends who yeah. are Gen Z are lower energy than my millennial friends. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We went outside. We played games. We actually hung yes. out and socialized. We actually had a healthier lifestyle. Gen Z, they're starting to go down with their health. I mean, I'm a, I, I do personal training as one of my things yeah. and uh, like bodybuilding stuff and I help people with their physiques. And, you know, sometimes those younger clients are they're a little less motivated when they're when when and I've called them out. Yeah, I'm like, dude, your 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 parent wants me to to get you to a place. I want to make sure you want to get to that place. And since then, we've had a much better connection with, with uh, some some clients. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just a, it's a general it's, thing. It's, and, a, uh, it's an interesting mindset, dude. Yeah. It's a very interesting mindset. And it, and it always makes me wonder. I'm like, dude, I think we need to like, like really practice the art of not being on technology. You know? Oh, that is an art. To stay away from that thing. Like yeah. that, if you can Seriously. stay away from this thing, you know, just, 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 just let it go. Yeah. And just let it kind of, <laughs> wow. You know, like I can't even, hang on, come back here. You know, I, I need yeah. the attention. Yeah. Post, swipe, everything. Yeah. I need it. I, I can't handle that. I, I'm telling Ooh. you, like, and I, I'm not even a millennial. I'm like right above, I'm like the cusp, <laughs> right? And I remember yeah. like the internet was a th barely coming out when I was in high school. Like, and I was like, I remember yes. being like. MySpace. Yeah. Like, and, and emails were coming out and I'm like asking my dad about this. I'm like, dad, do you think anyone's even going to use this? This is ridiculous. That's stupid. This is the dumbest Websites. thing. Websites. And like when I would call girls, I'd have to go talk to their parents first. I remember that. Yeah, you know, I had to call their landlines. We had like a oh, rotary phone. People that, don't even know how to use the rotary prank phone. Prank calls. Prank you calls. Know? Remember those things? Of like, course. People didn't know who you were. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. <sighs> now, like we live in a world where we, where we can't crank call each other. You know, call it's very idea. upsetting. Very upsetting. Mm -hmm. Um, dude, this has been so amazing. I appreciate you you're being amazing. on this podcast. Uh, you're amazing. You're, um, you're amazing. Come on, you're amazing. Uh, you're amazing. So, okay, we'll both be amazing. <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, let's. I, I just want to kind of wrap things up a little bit um, by asking a couple final questions. Sure. What is your greatest source of joy right now? The greatest source of, source of joy is probably being with those that I love. I love that. I mean, when you are around people who understand you, mm -hmm. then you don't have to be anybody else. I love and that. in the world right now where there's such facades and, you know, just it's fake. Yeah. You know, whether that's Photoshop or you do a video and it's funny. Oh, let's do it again. It wasn't real. Oh, it was more authentic the first time. And it's like, it's like this. Now you have to pretend to be yourself. Yeah. So if you can, like you said, remove the technology for a second and be around people that you love and that love you and understand you. And yeah. you're not judged. You're cool. Everything's fine. And then you can actually feel life and, and, and touch this thing called, you know, life. And oh, dude, I freaking love that. I mean, my, um, my nephew is 18 months old now. He's, he's such a cute little guy. And, um, just this morning he was, he and I were playing together and we went outside and he was like sitting in the dirt and like picking rocks up and showing me. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like the, and it was just so cool to see like the wonder in his eyes 
as he discovered a twig, you know, as he discovered a rock. <laughs> Those and he, are the days. I know, huh? dude. And he, like, and he found a box. I don't know how he, he found this box and he picked it up and he started picking up his rock and his favorite items and started putting it in the box. And I'm just like watching him being like, oh my gosh, he's got complete fullness of joy right now, <laughs> picking up these little rocks and having so much fun right now. And it was so simple and it was so amazing. And just by being with him, I felt joy. Mm-hmm. Isn't that amazing? It's contagious, man. It's contagious. So it's negative contagious. energy, though, too. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? So you're, we're talking about different energies, and, and they're both contagious, positive and negative. Mm. Um, with the joy, what is your, your, I guess, your greatest fear? My greatest fear? Yeah. Oh, gosh. That comes from my deepest, darkest insecurities. Okay. Okay. We don't have to talk about it then if we don't want yeah, to. Yeah. No. Being, being forgotten, being mm. useless, being nothing. I think at a point we all can connect to feeling like nothing. Yeah. Because if you like pause for a second. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Some people are like, what's Wait, going what on? Wait, what happened? What happened? But Why like, did you do you this? you can hear like the humming of computers or just yeah. the hum, like, like you can hear it. it exists. Yeah. But if you're part of that nothingness, then you're nothing. Yeah. And, and we all want to be significant to a point, even if it's just. Yeah. You know, to ourselves. That's There's, my biggest fear. Well, you know, it's interesting. There's, and I'm going to get a little uh, scriptural on you. Please. That's okay. So Bring it on. there's this, uh, uh, in the Book of Mormon, they, there's like this um, prophet, his name is Lehi, and he's talking about things all being a compound in one, you mm-hmm. know? Because, and he said, like, if things were just one body, they would, must remain as dead. And so I was thinking about this, and I had like this religion professor kind of break this down to us scientifically. And he was saying that all matter, all energy emit heat. Mm-hmm. They, they emit some sort of heat, right? But when it gets divided and cut down and cut down and cut down and cut down and cut down, like let's just say you could like just divide matter up over and over and over and over and over and over again, you eventually get to this point where that piece of matter that exists no longer produces heat. It, it has what's called heat death. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, it becomes nothing. It becomes nothing. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it like that, like, and you look at like the adversary, you look at like hard things in our life, sometimes it cuts us down over and over and over and over and over again until the point where it's like, I have no energy left. I've got nothing left. I am, I'm nothing, you know? And, but at the same time, like our value, when you partner with God and you get, filled with that light and that love and, and that hope. It's like you become completely significant. You become completely whole without the need of other people telling you, oh, I'm valuable. Mm-hmm. Without the need of overcompensating, right? So I just think it's it's powerful. So I, I love that you sa- you share that with me because that is a deep, dark fear of mine as well, you know, to get cut down like that. Oh, totally. I mean, if you're stymied, that's the right word. If you're halted with any any course of action you're trying to take in life, yeah. some people say, oh, I'm going to take that as a sign. That's, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Or maybe that is the adversary in a way saying, no, you're doing the right thing. i got to stop you. If yeah. stuff comes way too easy for you, like I've, or I think it was Marilyn Manson who said, if you're not being, uh, if you have no trials or you're not being hated on anything you're trying to do, you're probably not doing something right. Mm. I thought that was interesting. That's, and that's also interesting. with the light you're talking about, I just wanted to throw this in there. I've heard my, my younger brother is studying quantum physics. You're talking about molecular level yes, stuff. Yes, yes, yes. There is no way to measure darkness. We always measure the light. Mm. So, Why is that? So, I mean, I mean, I just thought that that was fascinating to throw that in there. If somebody somehow makes sense of that, he's a quantum physicist, you know, talking to this guy is like, yeah. whoa, we're all connected on this weird level. But when you go down to there, when you talk about heat, I've never heard of that before where... The heat is gone. Our energy, our frequency, our desire for life is gone. Everything's gone. Because we've stopped so many times. I mean, or being stopped. Sorry, the camera stopped. Yeah. Yeah, we're, 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 God is light. Yeah. Right? And so we need the sun. We need to go outside. We, we, we can't function eventually when that happens. We need God. We yeah. need, we need light. Absolutely. And so, I, just keep it, going, man. It, keep you going. Keep, keep going. swimming. You've got to keep swimming. Yeah, that you're gonna hit walls. Yeah. If you're hitting walls, you're doing something right. You're doing something right. Just Absolutely. keep going, man. <laughs> Jeez, stop stopping. Well, dude, you know what? I think you just answered my last question, which was going to be, what is the advice you'd give your younger self? Oh man, learn time travel. Join me. Yeah, um, seriously, that's pretty good. So I just probably write that down. Great. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, gosh, I wouldn't tell myself anything. Okay. I would not tell my younger self a single thing. Because I want him to go through what I went through. 
Mm, and if he that. didn't, I would become weak. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm super strong, but I'm much stronger because of those things. Yeah. So I'm if I could bear encouragement though, I would say, you know, you can keep going, go through it, but just know that, you know, you're not alone. Yeah. That's another thing too. If people think that they're alone. Yeah. That's not true. And that's not true. And that's beautiful advice, right? Yeah. Like just knowing like, hey, look, life is going to be hard, you know, but you're not alone. It's not just going to be hard, Sharon. Yeah. Life is going to be destructive. Ooh, you are yeah. going to be, okay, was, what was that one? If you're talking about uh, scriptural stuff or is it, was yeah. it a talk or something, somebody was saying, you know, you're in this house and, and God is in there knocking walls down and you want to be this cute little cottage yeah. and God's in there just busting the walls and destroying the roof and whatever the case and destroying your garden, what you thought you had in life. Who you thought you were going to be with, ghosted, for example. Yeah. What you thought you were going to do as a career. Look at my story. The, the, the money you thought you had, if, you yeah. had, if you've been robbed or, or stolen from. I've been through that stuff. You've been through your versions of that. We've all had our versions of being destroyed. And we think that it's just life sucks. So I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm done. Yeah. That's not the case. That is, that is you're allowed, let go and let God. Mm. Let him destroy your cottage so that you can become this mansion and you are going to stretch. There's no comfort in the, in, the stre- in, the, in the growth zone. There's no growth in the comfort zone, as they say, right? Yeah. Growing pains. If you want to grow, we all want to grow. If you're ripe, you rot. You mm. have to grow. Yeah. And it's going to hurt. Yeah. But dude. Life is hard. Yeah. And that's how we're going to end it. Yeah, Life I'm is good. hard, Sorry, you guys. No, but you no, it was amazing. No, I loved it. No, seriously, Eric, th- this has been amazing, man. And, and it's been so good you're to amazing. like hear your... You're amazing. Come on, we can keep going and going and going. <laughs> this is so fun. No, it's been such a great experience because every time I, I'm on this podcast talking to someone, I learn so much about myself. And I'm so blessed because I learned something uh, like that. And it's so great. And every time people come on, I, I'm like, this is, this is therapy. That's what this is. This mm. is therapy for, mm. for everyone, hopefully. But I really hope that um, our listeners today can get something really powerful out of it because you bore your soul today, man. And I really appreciate you sharing like the advice and the things that you've gone through. And as a result of it, how we can all become better. So thanks so much, man, for being open. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. man, of course. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for listening to the Lemonade Stand podcast, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you use to be alerted when we release new episodes. We'd also love to hear your feedback in the reviews, and if you or someone you know has an awesome Lemonade Stand story, please reach out to us on social media and let us know. Thanks so much, and have a great day.